Hey everyone, Professor Long here. Welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. Um, this lecture is intended for the students enrolled in my Biology 2402 course at Del Mar College. Uh, this is the third in a series of lectures on the digestive system. So this is digestion lecture number three. Um, we've gone over in the previous two lectures uh, the four major organic compounds, what enzymes digest them, how they're digested and absorbed into the digestive tract. And then we went through the six functions of the digestive system and the overall sort of a simplified anatomy of the digestive tract. Now, I've written the functions of the digestive system here again, ingestion, which is putting food into the tract, the oral cavity, mechanical processing, which is the physical breakdown of food, chewing with our teeth, gnashing with our tongue, the churning of the stomach. Digestion, which is the chemical breakdown of food with water and, and acids and enzymes. Secretion, the secretion of that water and the acids, the enzymes, in addition to some mucus and some buffers. Um, and we'll talk about that. Absorption, which means, you know, pulling the nu nutrients and the valuable molecules, vitamins and ions and things across the digestive lining into our tract, into our bloodstream. Um, and sending it off to our cells, and then elimination, which is the removal of all that stuff that our body cannot use, all the waste, the indigestible contents, and all of that. Um, so I've gone over all of those details a little bit with you, but now what we're going to do, to me the best way to learn the digestive system, is to know the anatomy, sort of the tract as I drew it last time, and then walk through the tract section by section and figure out which ones of these happen in which part of the tract. It's sort of a simplified way. So... I'm going to go over this. If you recall, and I, I redrew this because I erased it, but if you recall in our last um, session, we drew this picture of the digestive tract, starting with the oral cavity and going through the pharynx and esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, the large intestine or colon, the rectum and anus. We have the accessory structures, the liver and the gallbladder and their tubes and the pancreas. They dump into the duodenum and then the appendix down here. Now, I don't know how well you can see that, but Essentially, this is sort of the picture we did last time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on each part of the tract so that we can enlarge it here and see what happens where. If you're following along in my notes set, we have basically, essentially, in two lectures, only completed one page. We've got a long ways to go, but we're going to cover a lot of pages in the next couple of lectures. So we're picking up on page uh, 77 in the notes set. Uh, there will be worksheets coming for all of this as well. Finally, before I get too far... You guys know that this is all because of the coronavirus shutdown that we're doing all of this. Um, I'm nor not normally teaching online, and I'm teaching at home now. I got a smaller board, less space to work with, and um, I have two teenagers and a dog running around. So if you hear some odd noises in the background, please um, be forgiving. Uh, these are all one-take videos with no editing and all of that. I don't know how to do that software yet. Well, I'm going to learn, but we're under duress with a short time frame. So I'm just trying to crank these out so my students can finish their semester. Anyway, so on page 77, it begins to talk about the digestive tract. It tells you it's the tube that extends from the mouth to the anus and numerous accessory structures. We covered that. Just like we covered in the respiratory system, there is a mucosa. One of the things I like to go over, <clears throat> and this is aside from everything that we're really supposed to be doing, but I want to remind you of something. If I could cut through any part of the digestive tract, it is a long tube that runs from the oral cavity to the anus, right? Um, let's say I cut through the esophagus or the stomach or the small or the large intestine. Ultimately, all of those sections share some common features. There's a space in the middle called the lumen. And the lumen gets its name from the fact that when you slice, that's where luminescence or the light comes through. But usually the walls are somewhat folded up like this. And the wall is rather thick, and the whole tube appears round. Now, there are several layers of tissue that go through here. If I were to stick a sharp instrument from the inside, from the lumen, all the way through the wall here, it's going to pass through some layers in a specific order. Of course, if you can reach in from the outside world and touch something, your skin, the surface of your eyeball, picking your nose, scratching the back of your throat, if you reach in from the other end and lock your fingers in the stomach or something... Everywhere that you could stick uh, something in and, and rub a surface, that surface is going to be an epithelium, the epithelial linings of the body. <clears throat> so if I were starting here, I'm going to go through several layers of tissue. 
underneath the epithelium. I'm going to try to color code this to some degree, okay? And I don't know how well some of these colors show up, but I'm going to do my best. Right underneath the epithelium is going to be some layer of connective tissue. And we'd go all the way around, but I'm not going to worry about that. Then there's going to be a, some kind of layer of muscle. And this muscle layer will go all the way around the tract like this. And actually, this inner layer is two layers of muscle going all the way around, at least in the digestive tract. And this is smooth muscle, visceral muscle. And then there's going to be a layer of connective tissue. It goes all the way around. The connective tissue layers usually are very vascular. They have nerves running through them and some other things. Then there's going to be a thicker layer of muscle tissue going all the way around. And again, this is two layers of muscle tissue. And I'm going to draw them a specific way and I'm going to explain this. But some of the muscle fibers are going around the tract and some are running towards you this way, like looking at one set of fingers running this way and another set of fingers pointing at you like this. So there's two layers of muscle tissue there. There's two layers of muscle tissue. Each one has two sublayers. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Then there's some connective tissue out here going all the way around. And then there's an epithelium. So if we were to list all this out, it goes epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle, connective tissue, muscle, connective tissue, epithelial tissue. These top three layers, and our book actually does it a little differently. Several, I've you know, checked a bunch of textbooks, and some do it as two layers, some do it as three layers. I learned it that these three layers right here are called the mucosa. There's the epithelium, there's the connective tissue, and the connective tissue is usually called the lamina propria. I put LP here, but it's usually called the lamina propria. That's the layer of connective tissue just deep to the epithelial lining. And then the muscle layer in here would be called the muscularis interna because it's the inner layer of muscle. <clears throat> Since those three layers make up a mucosa, the layer just deep to that would be called the submucosa. That's this layer of connective tissue, very often called the submucosa. This is the muscularis interna. I'll put MI there. This is the muscularis externa. So I have an inner layer and an outer layer of muscle tissue. So epithelium connective tissue called the lamina propria. This would be called digestive epithelium. Lamina propria, muscularis interna. Those three layers make up a mucosa. The muscularis interna very often is called the muscularis mucosa, the muscle layer of the mucosa. And then there's a submucosa. Then there's the muscularis externa. The muscularis externa has two layers, inner circular, outer longitudinal muscle. Same thing for the muscular, muscularis interna, but we're not going to focus on it as much. But the inner layer is always circular because it goes around the tube. The outer layer is always longitudinal because it runs the length of the tube. Imagine in three dimension this tube running in this direction. These muscle fibers would be running the length. These would be going around. Inner circular, outer longitudinal. Outside of that, <clears throat> there's a layer called the subserosa, which is this connective tissue. It's usually called the subserosa, and the reason it's called that is because the outer layer of epithelium is called the serosa. The serosa is also the visceral peritoneum, if you remember the, the serous membranes. So as we're going through the tract, whether we're in the esophagus, whether we're in the stomach, whether we're in the small or large intestine, we have these layers. They're very common to a lot of tubes in the body. Epithelium connective, muscle connective, muscle connective epithelium. It's the digestive epithelium, the lamina propria, muscularis interna, has two layers, inner circular, outer longitudinal. This, since those three layers make up a mucosa, the next layer of connective tissue is called the submucosa, the muscularis externa, two sublayers, inner circular, outer longitudinal, and then there's the subserosa and the serosa. So for surgical text, that stuff's important because you have to sew the correct layer to the correct layer if you make incisions through the, the lining of the tract and stuff. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk about the mucosa. This is what's on page 77. The mucosa has its three layers, um, and it tells you this stuff. I'm just going to read it straight out of the note set for those of you following along. It tells you in the mouth and the, upper, uh, the pharynx and the upper part, one-third the esophagus, and then near the end of the tract. 
So at the beginning and at the end of the tract, um, the epithelium is stratified squamous. You should recall that we always have stratified layers, multiple layers, where we want protection from abrasion and things. So you can stick your finger in your mouth and scratch it. You can, when you swallow a chip or something sharp, it can scratch up the edges. If something's sliding out the other end or sliding in the other end, depending on what you prefer, <laughs> um, it can scrape the walls, you know. So we want stratified squamous epithelium. Most of the tract, from about a, a, a third of the esophagus down all the way till we get to the rectum, is a simple columnar epithelium. And it's got microvilli for absorption. So no, it's stratified squamous at the beginning and end. It's simple columnar throughout most of the tract. The lamina propria tells you is loose connective tissue. It has lots of nerves and blood vessels and lymphatics and things. The muscularis mucosa or muscularis interna, it talks about on the note set, it's a, single, uh, it's a double layer of smooth muscle. And the submucosa is um, a lot of connective tissue with larger vessels and lymphatics in it called the submucosal plexus. It's got lots of lymph vessels and nerves and other things controlling all of this. Um, in some parts of the digestive tract, some of these layers, by the way, have many glands in them that can secrete things. So uh, the submucosa very often can have submucosal glands in it that will secrete some of the compounds that need to um, be dumped into the digestive tract. And then there's the muscularis externa. It tells you it's a large double layer. The inner layer is circular. The outer layer is longitudinal. There is one exception to that rule. In the stomach, because we have segmentation in these churning contractions, we have a third layer of smooth muscle in the muscularis externa only. The muscularis ex externa, the innermost of the three layers, is called the uh, oblique muscle because they run at angles and they allow the stomach to twist and churn, almost as if you were trying to wring out a rag or something. So some of the smooth muscle is going to contract in waves like this. We call this peristalsis, the wave-like contractions that are moving things through the tract. The circular muscle will also squeeze in order, almost like you, if you were trying to squeeze something out of a piping bag or squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. You squeeze, and then as you squeeze the next section and pour stuff down, this muscle relaxes, and then the next one squeezes, and it's almost like a wave, only they squeeze this way. So peristalsis is done by these muscles, and then the segmentation is that oblique muscle churning and mixing the stomach. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then we have the subserosa and serosa, okay? So you guys should know this sort of cross-section of the digestive tract. We're going to focus a lot on the um, epithelial lining and on the muscularis externa. <clears throat> now, as we go through the tract, when we start to enter the oral cavity, I'm going to erase a bunch of my writing here, and I'm going to start with the oral cavity, get through the esophagus, and try to get into the stomach in this video, and then we'll move on to some other things, okay? So... From that drawing that I showed you, we're going to zone in on, or focus in on, the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus. As you know, the pharynx goes down to where it splits to go into the trachea, and then we have the esophagus running here, dumping into the stomach. Okay. So these are the things, that this is how I like to try to learn this digestive system. Um, sorry, I'm looking for a marker over here. So in the oral cavity, the buccal cavity, what all is going on and what is the details about it? The buccal cavity, also called the oral cavity, okay? So, well, first of all, we have ingestion. I can simply plug these numbers in and then we can talk about what's happening here. We have ingestion, putting food in the tract. We also have mechanical processing. And like I said, we chew with the teeth, and we gnash with our tongue and our cheeks and everything. And we're constantly, um, oops, I, I didn't do that quite pretty enough or the way that I wanted, but we chew and gnash, and it is your tongue that does a lot of gnashing, okay? So we know that we do ingestion and mechanical processing, and that's going to physically break down the food. We're also going to have a lot of secretion. And when it comes to secretions here, oops, put the wrong number. Secretion. When it comes to secretion, the mouth secretes 
saliva. Sorry, I'm not doing that too well, but just bear with me because I'm not reshooting this video. What are the contents of saliva? Again, let me rewrite that. I keep messing up my thingy here. These really are improv. I don't have a whole lot of script. This is kind of how I do lecture. So saliva has a number of substances in it. It's got water. We've already talked about the function of water. It moistens the food, dissolves food, softens it, and lubricates it so it can slide through the track. <clears throat> Just like dumping a chip or bread in water, it gets very soggy and mushy. They're, they secrete mucus. Our salivary glands, and remember there's three pairs of salivary, salivary glands. There's the parotid glands out here. There's the submandibular glands, and then there's the sublingual glands right underneath the tongue. You should know their anatomy. I'm not going to get into which gland secretes more water or more mucus or more enzyme or more buffer, but nonetheless, um, there's water, there's mucus. Um, we know that mucus coats the food and lubricates the tract and things. There is uh, enzymes, and in particular, we secrete a lot of amylase. There's a stuff called salivary amylase. And amylase, as you should recall, breaks down carbohydrates into monosaccharides and disaccharides. And it would make sense that we want to break down a lot of sugars first because without energy, nothing else works. You can have the fanciest car. You can have a Ferrari parked in your driveway. But if you don't have fuel for it, you can sit in your driveway and listen to the radio and wave at people as they come by. But it's not the same as driving around in your Ferrari. So without energy, nothing works. So we start breaking down sugars in the mouth. Now, when we're young, especially, we also, I'm going to put it in parentheses, secrete lingual lipase. So there's salivary amylase from the sal salivary glands, and there's lingual lipase. Lipase can digest fats. When we're babies and we drink breast milk, there's a tremendous amount of fat in it, and that fat's necessary. We really need the fat as babies to help our brain grow and develop. There's a lot of um, uh, fats in the brain, sphingomyelin and some other things. So... Um, but predominantly, we break down carbohydrates in the mouth. We begin carbohydrate digestion in the mouth. There's not a lot of other enzymes for breaking down proteins and other things. Okay, So there's water, there's mucus, there's enzymes, and then there are buffers. The buffers, as you know, neutralize things, can neutralize acids or strong bases. And particularly, the buffers in salivary amylase um, are there to try to neutralize some of the acidic foods that we eat. So... When you eat um, something that's soaked in acid, if you eat balsamic vinegar, if, uh, if you're having bruschetta with some balsamic vinegar, or if you're having, um, uh, I don't know, pickles and drinking pickle juice and pickle poppers like kids do at ballparks, um, you need to neutralize some of that acid because it can irritate some of your digestive tract. So these are the main ingredients that we find in saliva. You need to know the components of saliva. You need to know them for testing purposes and forever. Water. You need to know the functions, mucus, the functions, the enzymes. You should know the functions of these enzymes and the buffers. Now, one of the other things that we need to know about the oral cavity, I'm going to erase all of this now, um, is because we do have the acids and the enzymes, we do do some of the digestion. So these four main functions are happening in the oral cavity. Ingestion, the mechanical processing with chewing and gnashing, the secretion of water and mucus and enzymes and buffers, and the enzymes in the water are helping break stuff down. Um, and the enzymes particularly are digesting carbohydrates. And again, as babies, we can secrete lingual lipase and a stuff called renin. Um, not the same renin from the renin-angiotensin pathway. This renin has two ends, and it plays a role in helping digest some of the contents of the foods we need as a baby. Lots of breast milk. Now, as we swallow, the process of swallowing, again, I'm going to erase some of this. The process of swallowing is called deglutition. You should know that. It tends to be a popular question on a lot of these tests. But deglutition simply means swallowing. When we swallow, your tongue actually makes sort of a wave-like motion in your mouth. And the reason the roof of your mouth is sort of curved is not because... Someone had to press on it to keep the soft spots in the skull, the fontanelles, from collapsing. Like there's a lot of old wives' tales about that. But um, the reason the roof of the mouth is shaped the way that it is is that when we swallow, if your the roof of your mouth is like this, your tongue will actually make a wave 
as it swallows from front to back. It kind of does this, like you doing a wave, okay? As a matter of fact, if you close your eyes and stop for a second and swallow, you can feel your tongue do this. And that wave-like motion forms the food into almost a little bullet-shaped substance called a bolus. A bolus is sort of a bullet-shaped or oval mass of food so that it actually slides through the tract. So we help form that. So anyway, all of this information that I'm talking about, you guys can get on page 78 and page 79 of my note set. I've got a bunch of the notes written for you. On page 78 and 79, we talk about all of this. So I'm going to go through page 78 real quick. You guys need to read the information at the top about the saliva and bolus and swallowing. We list the glands there. It asks you what is salivary amylase, what is a buffer, and what roles do water and mucus play. We've already covered that. We've covered the anatomy of the teeth, and I'm not going to go into it all in, in too tremendous um, detail, but suffice it to say that if I were to erase all this, well, before I get to the teeth, let me just finish this part. Once the bolus is swallowed, it enters the oropharynx, passes by the laryngopharynx, enters the esophagus, and then heads towards the stomach. And quite honestly, the esophagus and the pharynx are simply transport tubes. They don't really do a whole bunch of this stuff. We just get the stuff from the oral cavity to the stomach. Um, the upper one-third of the esophagus has some skeletal muscle, so it's under voluntary control. And then once food gets a certain uh, distance down, we transition from skeletal muscle slowly to smooth muscle, Those that smooth muscle we drew in the last drawing. And... Um, that's why sometimes if you swallow and things get stuck down there so far, there's not a whole lot to do, and you start kind of freaking out, and your eyes water, and, well, the smooth muscle is going to eventually get it down. It can't get it up. You can't get it down because it's beyond our conscious control, and the smooth muscle only contracts in one direction. All right, so um, now the next thing I want to talk about. So I'm going to erase all of this. Hopefully you got those notes, and we're going to talk a little bit about the teeth. As you guys know, the teeth have different shapes. And in, the, in babies, we have 20 teeth. Um, our primary dentition, as we get older, those um, baby teeth, the roots start to get worn away and rot away as the adult teeth of the secondary dentition are coming in. That's why sometimes when a tooth comes out, there's not much of a root left. We, our body dissolves away some of that root. Um, but nonetheless, the teeth, when in adults, we have 32 teeth on average. Um, you don't see all 32. You see 28. The last four are buried. They're called wisdom teeth or the third molars. Uh, wisdom teeth are called that because they come in when we're older and wiser, supposedly. Um, and because the, the, the mandible has evolved sort of and shortened over evolution, those wisdom teeth, which would have come in rather straight, are now at the bend of the mandible near the... Um, near the ramus, and if they come in at an, at an angle forward, they're going to push all your other teeth forward and cause problems, and they can cause a lot of issues, so we sometimes have to have them pulled. Nonetheless, the shapes of the teeth provide their function. I'm going to draw both an anterior and a lateral view of each tooth. One of the teeth is called an incisor. Incisors get their name from the word incision, to slice or chop, and that's exactly what they do. You guys need to know how many there are. You need to know... Um, what their function is in the digestive system or in, in when it comes to chewing. So for incisors, you should have eight. There's four on top and four on bottom. Your buck teeth and the two bottom ones in the middle are called central incisors. And then next to that would be your lateral incisors. And they really slice and chop food. So if you're going to bite a carrot or something, you want to cut something cleanly, you can chop it there. The next shape of tooth, and by the way, incisors are shaped like this. If you look at them from the front, they have a single root, and they're flat straight across. And from a lateral view, they have a really pretty sharp top, almost like a hatchet, you know, that you would use in the yard. The next kind of tooth we're going to look at is going to be called um, a cuspid. Cuspids are also called canines. You should have four of those. And they really are fangs, so to speak. And one of the things that they are used for is that they can help tear and slash things, okay? So if you're trying to rip a piece of steak, if you've ever seen hyenas eating a carcass, they bite with their incisors and rip. They're like little spikes that grab onto something and help you rip or tear things um, out. So if you're trying to bite a piece of steak, 
you can rip it or slash it and tear it. So if we look at a cuspider canine, they have a similar root, but they have this prominent spike kind of right in the middle. I didn't draw that one very uniformly, but they really have that little point in there that allows them to grab onto things. From a lateral view, they're a little bit thicker than an incisor, but not a whole bunch. And I didn't draw a very pretty one there. But anyway, you get the picture, okay? You've seen the models in lab. Now, the next tooth kind of looks similar to a cuspid from one view, but looks a little bit like a molar for another view. So I'm going to erase my incisor up here, and I'm going to show you what's called the bicuspid or premolar. I think this black marker is losing some of its magic, although it's not a magic marker. Um, but the bicuspid or premolar, oh, that one's much better, looks from an anterior view very much like a canine, only the little hump in the middle is not quite as pronounced, but there is a little bit of a hump here. From a lateral view, they have a little flat ridge on the backside, and you should know that you have eight premolars. Okay, so there's two on top and bottom on either side of the mouth. They're called premolars because they're just before we get to the molars. So um, their function is really to kind of crush things. They do do some grinding, but they're really for crushing something. If you wanted to crack something really hard, you bite them with those. The spike kind of holds on to it. This part helps smash it and crack it open. Okay, and then... The last one I'm going to draw is our molars. Molars are probably the most famous looking tooth of all. One thing that's unique about molars is they can have multiple roots, either two or three. Um, on a rare occasion, you'll see molars with four. Um, they have very kind of almost flattened crowns. So when we look at a molar, you should know that there's 12 molars. There's three here, three here, three on each side on top and bottom. And the third, there's called the first, second, and third molar. The third molars are not visible. They're your wisdom teeth. They're usually buried in bone. And really, these do a whole lot of grinding. Okay. Now, if I looked at it from another view, it would look very similar. So the surface of the tooth, where the tooth meets the tooth, this surface on top is called the occlusal surface. Okay. The occlusal surface of the molars would be like you fitting your knuckles together. And so when you chew and you move your teeth around, they kind of grind things down, like eating lettuce and things and grinding stuff up into very fine molecules, almost like a mortar and pestle or a mocajete. So now you know the numbers of teeth. You know the functions of teeth. You should know the anatomy of the tooth, that they are covered with enamel on the crown, uh, the um, the root of the tooth is covered with a different substance, different chemical makeup called cementum. Most of the tooth is made up of a stuff similar to bone called dentin. Dentin, one of the differences between dentin and bone is that dentin lacks the osteoblasts and the cells that we have in bone, which is why if you crack or damage a tooth, it doesn't really heal deep down, which is also why cavities can be dangerous. Um, because once we eat through the enamel, the bacteria will eat up that bony substance and digest the tooth and get down to the pulp cavity. Once we get to the pulp cavity, that's when you start to feel the um, cavity and you're damaging the nerve. By that time, there's not a whole lot to do to save the tooth. So you should get your teeth checked. You, could, you should make sure that if you start the development of any cavities, the ones that haven't eaten through the enamel, you get them kind of ground up, touched up a little bit, and then they fill them in. You get fillings done to preserve the length of the life of your teeth. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff you guys will learn when you all do dental hygiene. This is about as simple as I can make it. Um, now, I'm going to stop here for this video because we have covered um, about 30 minutes worth of material, and we've covered page 78. You guys should be able to fill in all that information in your note set. We're going to move on to page 79. Actually, one last thing I want to do before I get to the mouth. Um, the top of page 79, it talks about the three regions of the pharynx. And what type of tissue lines them? The nasopharynx is lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar because of air passing through. The oropharynx is lined with stratified squamous. So is the laryngopharynx. And so you, uh, you need to know that, that epithelial lining and the functions of it. We actually covered that with the respiratory system, so you can look up that chart. And there's a little um, 
paragraph in the notes on the esophagus that talks about deglutition, talks about the esophageal hiatus. So as the esophagus comes down, it passes through this big sheet-like muscle, this large sheet-like muscle, and there's a hole in that muscle, and that opening is called the hiatus, the esophageal hiatus, and the, the esophagus will pass through to the stomach as your stomach's below the diaphragm. That's where hiatal hernias come from. You should read about hiatal hernias, what causes them and how dangerous they can be. Um, and then there's a sphincter muscle at the end of the esophagus called the esophageal sphincter. That sphincter can close up so that food cannot regurgitate or exit the stomach and come back up into the esophagus. Humans actually have um, voluntary control over that muscle. And so we can actually um, regurgitate or vomit if you were to eat some toxins. Some animals do not have conscious control of that muscle. So if you feed them a poison, they die. They absorb it all and die. Um, like rats and, and uh, uh, horses and other animals. Goats have a hard time vomiting. Um, so it's kind of an advantage for us. If you ate some strychnine, some rat poison, as soon as your body starts absorbing the toxins, you would try to expel it so that you could get rid of that toxin before you absorb it. Other animals can't, and they would die from the poisoning. So that's the esophageal sphincter, also called the cardiac sphincter, because of the region of the stomach where we find it called the cardia. Anyway, all of that's in your notes. You guys can read that stuff. Um, I'm going to stop the video now. We're hitting 30 minutes, and I think that's about the, the best length for a video. Um, we'll go on to page uh, the bottom of page 79 in the stomach in the next video, and then we'll pass through the digestive tract. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned something, um, and uh, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.